All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for attending Hope's Advancing Fair Lending for Small Business in the Deep South webinar. My name is Kia Burt, Senior Policy Analyst at Hope Policy Institute, the policy and advocacy arm of Hope Enterprise Corporation and Hope Credit Union. Hope is a community development financial institution whose mission it is to increase financial inclusion throughout the Deep South, which includes states Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. For over 26 years, we've leveraged nearly $3 billion in community development financing to help underserved communities realize their financial goals. To kick off today's discussion, we will first hear greetings from our CEO, Bill Bynum, and then we will hear from our Director of Policy, Diane Stannard. Thank you again, and we're looking forward to the conversation. My name is Bill Bynum, and on behalf of my colleagues at Hope, I want to thank you for joining us today. Small businesses in the Deep South are foundational to our economies and to our communities. As a matter of fact, Hope was established 27 years ago to help ensure that underserved Delta communities had fair access to the resources needed to support businesses that provide good jobs regardless of their race or gender. This has remained a priority as our work expanded across the Deep South. Today, we call on you to join us in this important fight for equity and inclusion. Shortly, you will hear how you can do this, but first, I want to focus on why this is so important. Not only are small businesses owned by people of color vital in our daily lives, but they are central drivers of the overall economy. Prior to the pandemic, Black-owned businesses created over three and a half million jobs across the country. This number will be higher if Black businesses had access to the resources they need to start and grow. However, despite their contributions, businesses owned by people of color have historically been denied access to capital. In Arkansas, for example, from 2017 to 2020, just one and a half percent of SBA 7A loans went to Black-owned businesses, even though Black businesses comprise 9% of businesses in the state. Notably, more than 60% of Black-owned businesses in Arkansas are owned by women. Across the country, Black businesses are more likely to be denied or discouraged than white-owned businesses when they seek credit. These disparities are not new. They are rooted in a long history of discriminatory practices by financial institutions. These historic patterns manifested during the pandemic and in the recovery efforts. In the first few months of the pandemic, the number of Black business owners declined by 41% and Latino business owners declined by 32% compared to 17% for white businesses. Yet entrepreneurs of color are most likely to struggle to get access to the $800 billion Paycheck Protection Program. As a matter of fact, during the initial rollout of the program, as hundreds of billions of dollars were being deployed, sole proprietors were excluded from participating. Why does this matter? Because 96% of Black and Latino owned businesses in the Deep South are sole proprietors. We saw firsthand how these challenges played out in communities of color. When a Black insurance agent in Memphis went to the window of one of the largest banks in America, he was told to go to Hope Credit Union to get a PPP loan, despite having an account at that bank. Similarly, in New Orleans, a Black barber was unable to get a call back from the bank where he had put his money for more than three decades. Company after company, retailers, healthcare providers, dentists, restaurants, nonprofit service providers, even a historically black college were shut out of the program by traditional lenders. Today, we're presented with a historic opportunity to change this reality, and we need your help. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has proposed new rules that require financial institutions to be transparent and provide data about who they approve and deny for small business loans with a focus on businesses owned by women and people of color. Congress mandated that CFPB implement this framework in Section 1071 of the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act, the reform legislation that was passed in the wake of the financial crisis. Hope has been engaged with CFPB since the early stages of this process, including serving on a review panel to provide guidance in the development of the proposed rules. We work hard to take your concerns to the halls of power and influence. Now at this critical juncture, we need your help. 
The Consumer Bureau is seeking public input on their proposal, and now is the time to ensure that voices from the Deep South are heard loud and clear. Shortly, my Hope Policy Institute colleagues will provide details on this process and how you can engage. I want to close by emphasizing that the steps we take today and the actions that we urge the Consumer Bureau to take in enacting lending laws that protect all small businesses is vital to closing the racial wealth gap in this country. While white adults have 13 times the wealth of black adults, this gap closes to three to one when comparing white businesses to black owned businesses. Closing the racial wealth gap has the potential to increase the gross domestic product between one and one and a half trillion dollars by 2028. Closing the small business capital gap strengthens the vitality of the economy as a whole and provides a pathway for closing the racial wealth gap. And the steps you take after today will move us toward this goal. Thank you again for joining us in this important work. Diane, if you're speaking, uh, you're still muted. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going. Thank you all for for joining. Um, we are so glad that you are here uh, today. And you know, we just heard from uh, we just heard from Bill. I'm just gonna scoot back up to the top here, a little preview of what's coming. Um, <laughs> but you just heard from uh, from Bill about why this. Um, why this is so important to us here at Hope. And you know, we are so glad that you're here and here to learn how to take steps, take the next steps with us in, in this effort to ensure fair lending for small businesses. So uh, if you have the time, uh, please drop, drop into the chat, you know, your name, where you're from, why does this issue matter to you? Um, if there's any experiences um, you'd like to share, just let us know why you're here today. Why does fair lending for small business matter? And you know this will help inform the next steps that, that we wanna take. So please introduce yourself in the chat and we look forward to hearing from you and following up after today. Um, so a little bit of before diving into the details of the rule um, and the proposal is just a little bit of, of level setting of you know what is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and why are they issuing this rule? So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is essentially a consumer watchdog to prevent uh, unfair practices in the financial marketplace. It was created following the financial crisis in 2008 to prevent unfair, abusive, and deceptive practices. You know, they have a lot of tools available to, to do this. Uh, they, have, they can take enforcement actions against lenders for and other financial service providers for um, for these unfair practices. They can do research and provide educational materials. And another thing they can do is essentially issue new rules of the road for financial service actors to follow to make sure that uh, borrowers and consumers are treated fairly in the financial marketplace. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's um, ability to issue these new rules of the road to ensure fair lending um, for, for small businesses. And so, um, the why so why is the CFPB doing this? Why are they issuing these new rules for small for for lenders uh, and their transparency and how they treat um, small businesses? They're doing it because Congress is mandating that they do it. Uh, when the CFPB was created um, in 2010 as part of the uh, Dodd Frank um, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, um, the Congress said the CFPB you need to should carry out the rulemaking and implementation for these new rules to ensure we're collecting the data and understanding which small businesses are being served and which ones are not. So this is what brings us uh, to today. The CFPB is now carrying out this work to develop and implement these new potential rules. So this data and its importance that we're going to talk about today is very parallel to existing civil rights legislation that already exists for the mortgage market called the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act or HMDA. So HMDA already for decades has required lenders to gather and report data about the race, ethnicity, gender, other demographics of who they lend mortgage loans to, who they don't, who gets denied. 
And, you know, those are the same types of questions and answers we want about small business lending, um, especially given the role that home ownership and small business lending play in closing the wealth gap that Bill was talking about in his greeting. And Hope, um, Bill also mentioned that Hope has been uh, connected to this process over the time to even to where we got to this point today. Uh, so earlier um, last year, Hope was part of a group of, of, of lenders that were pulled together to, by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to provide input to an earlier stage of the process. And we know through that experience of Hope providing that input and sharing what is important uh, to addressing the disparities um, in access to capital for small businesses in our region, it's clear that the CFPB is listening and it's clear they are taking our input and they are taking it seriously. And we need to keep uh, informing them about what is needed for the Deep South and for them to hear from not just Hope, but to hear from all of you. And that's what Bill is uh, referring to when he says, we need your help. Uh, we need your help to ensure Deep South voices are heard and to in be participate in this public comment period, which we'll talk about at the end of the webinar of exactly how to submit a public comment and what tools we'll make available to you to do that. So we just talked about, you know, what is the CFPB? Why are they issuing this new proposal? I just want to cover briefly, you know, why is this new proposal so important for fairness in the Deep South in particular? And this is just a small snapshot of why. Um, one of the reasons why is because small businesses, black owned businesses, businesses owned by people of color and women owned businesses play such a significant role in our communities and the economy and our region. And so, um, so you can see here that, you know, there's over 2 million businesses across the deep South of Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee. And over 99% of these businesses are considered small businesses. Uh, nearly one in four of the businesses owned, in, uh, nearly one in four businesses across the Deep South are owned by people of color, with most of those being black owned businesses. We you see in Mississippi and Louisiana, nearly 30% of businesses in those states are owned by people of color. And across the Deep South, one in three businesses are owned by women. So ensuring that these businesses have access to the capital that they need to grow, to start, to maintain their businesses, you know, contributes to their own economic vitality as well as the economic vitality of our region and our communities. And so just um, before turning it over to Kiad, you know, when we say we want strong, fair lending rules and we want this to be a meaningful outcome of, by, you know, in this process, uh, what do we mean? What is important for the Deep South? So these are our sort of three policy guideposts or priorities that we'll be talking through uh, during today's webinar. One, we wanna make sure we have rules that effectively cover the full market of small business lending. If it's not a comprehensive coverage of the small business market, it's not gonna do its job. It's not gonna work. And it's not gonna provide the transparency and accountability that's needed that small businesses deserve. Second, we need to ensure that the right data points are collected to reflect the reality and challenges faced by small businesses. And third, we need to make sure that the data once collected is actually published in a way that is accessible and robust and meaningful um, in order to both for the public and other stakeholders to ensure that lenders really are accountable and transparent, not only to capture harm and to identify harm on the back end, but knowing that this transparency and accountability mechanism is in place maybe prevent these discriminatory lending practices from happening in the first place is ultimately the, where we want to go to closing the wealth gap uh, that Bill mentioned and, and the, that's how we fit into that big picture goal. So now I will turn it over to Kiad to uh, kick us off to dive a little bit more deeply into the first uh, policy guidepost or priority guidepost of ensuring full coverage of, of, of the small business lending market. All right, thank you so much, Diane. So as Diane just mentioned, the first priority concerning 1071 for the Deep South is concerning full coverage of the small business lending marketplace. Now the CFPB is correctly proposing to cover most lenders with only the very narrow exception to exclude lenders that make less than 25 loans over the course of, over the course of two years. 
the CFPB should not expand this exemption. In a region like the Deep South, where there are fewer larger banks, communities are more likely to be serviced by smaller banks, which typically have smaller loan volumes, but may also disproportionately account for a significant amount of small business lending. Section 1071 reporting requirements will not only apply to banks, small and large, but it will also apply to credit unions, online lending companies, other non-depository institutions, community development financial institutions, and government lending entities. It's important to cover, it's important that 1071 covers all of these lenders in order for the reporting requirements to have their intended effect of understanding what is happening in the small business lending market. It must ensure expansive coverage without any loopholes. Now, I wanna take the time to emphasize why including government entities in 1071 is important for our region. Deep South states have historically failed to serve businesses of color and continue to do so even with federal funds. For example, in the state of Tennessee's administration of the CARES Act, last year, 90% of Tennessee's Small Business CARES Act funds went to white owned businesses due to a racially discriminatory formula. Businesses in other Deep South states such as Alabama may have faced similar outcomes, but we won't know because it's unclear. State agencies did not publicly report small business lending data by race and gender. So 1071, if implemented, can help illuminate and clarify the lending practices and patterns of state agencies and other lenders who do not report their lending by race and gender publicly. So I'm going to turn over to Diane to talk about the type of applications and originations that are covered under 1071, generally speaking, the lending activity. Great. Thank you, Kiad. This is continuing our first policy guidepost of ensuring full coverage of the marketplace, not only what lenders are covered, but what type of lending activity is covered. Um, so one thing importantly is that it includes a broad range of loan products. So traditional loan products that you might think about when small businesses seek to access business, regular loans, lines of credit, credit cards, as well as um, sort of what you think about as non-traditional alternative forms of credit that uh, such as merchant cash advances, which is primarily made online and the merchant cash advances based on the experiences we've seen in the deep South and elsewhere, uh, have a tendency to be high cost and, and abusive with APRs reaching up to 99% um, in some cases. So it is really critical that the CFPB has covered this broad range of uh, lending products that reflect the reality of the variety of ways in which small businesses, particularly small businesses owned by people of color and women, seek access to small business credit. Also importantly for the Deep South, the CFPB is is correctly proposing to include, and we should affirm and support the inclusion of uh, lenders of uh, activity related to farm loans. Uh, this is particularly important for a region like the Deep South because as is well documented, black farmers in the Deep South have faced decades of discrimination from lending institutions, both from private lenders and from government entities. So this constrained access to capital um, has contributed to the staggering loss of black owned farmland in the deep south. And so it is incredibly helpful for the Consumer Bureau to require lenders, including the Farm Credit Service, to report on the race and ethnicity and other demographics of those who seek to apply for credit at these institutions and the outcomes of those farmers who do receive loans and those who don't. Another important element is um, you know, well, just sticking with the coverage, um, the there are ways that the rule could be strengthened to more fully cover uh, small businesses' experiences. There are other types of alternative uh, credit products that be, could be included, uh, such as factoring, um, and also the definition of a small business still needs to be expanded uh, in their coverage to ensure um, the maximum coverage of experiences are documented as part of this rule. And then the final point, we just want to note the importance of what uh, Trend, what activity will be covered, it will cover both applications and originations. So by covering applications, just like uh, Humda does, you know, that's how we'll be able to tell the story of who's seeking uh, credit and what type and from what lenders and what was the outcome, as, as Kiad will talk about, um, and not just who ultimately gets the loan, but who's applying for it and who's being denied and who's getting it. And on this point of, of capturing what's happening when people apply for these loans, it's really critical as the Bureau has done is propose a fairly broad definition of application. 
So it's capturing not just a fully completed application, <laughs> but it's capturing when people sort of begin the process and make an oral or written request for, for a, a, a applying for, for credit at a lender. And we know this is critical because this um, in the Deep South where, and elsewhere across the country, where people don't always necessarily feel supported or welcomed at the financial institutions uh, where they are. And so we wanna make sure um, this is helpful in making sure uh, lenders are accountable from the very beginning of the process. And so we can see here in Arkansas why this is um, important as sort of this broad definition of application and, and origination. So in Arkansas, um, only 50% of entrepreneurs of color feel supported by their lending institution compared with 80% of white entrepreneurs. And we can see here that they also face higher denial rates when seeking access to credit. And these barriers are particularly pronounced for female entrepreneurs of color, which are three times more likely to be denied uh, credit than their white female counterparts. So this is just a small snapshot, which underscores the importance of gathering this data more robustly and across the full spectrum of the market. So now I will turn it over to Kia to talk about what actually type of data must be collected. Again, thank you, Diane. Um, so as she just so eloquently stated, 1071 is going to be impactful, not just because of its exhaustive coverage, but also due to its uh, collection of the correct data points in, in telling the story of small businesses of color. Uh, what's interesting is that 1071 already proposes to collect and report several key data points that we think are good. Under the proposal, financial institutions will be required to collect data about the borrower, such as race, ethnicity, gender, time of business, and industry type, and also data about the loan, which includes pricing information and loan type. Again, it's important to note that race and gender will be collected in a disaggregated fashion, which will provide specificity and preciseness in understanding lending outcomes in an intersectional manner. Meaning, if 1071 is implemented, we can understand the lending outcomes of a black woman business owner, for example. Relatedly, the collection of pricing is critical to detect instances in which businesses of color and women-owned businesses may have received higher priced financial products when other comparable businesses did not. In addition, <clears throat> in addition to these data points, 1071 will also require data on the outcome of the application. Things like loan approval, application withdrawals, denial, loan denials, and the reasons associated with those denials. So overall, the proposed data will provide a detailed picture of the challenges that beset women-owned businesses and businesses of color in access and affordable capital but the picture is incomplete if all necessary data is not captured. We suggest that the CFPB include in 1071 credit score and business type in the reporting requirements. Currently, the CFPB does not include credit score, but if credit score is not included, we cannot make comparison of treatment. We cannot tell if a white owned business with a poor credit score is receiving a more affordable financial product than a black owned business with a good credit score. Similarly, without business type, we cannot accurately assess the experiences of most businesses of color. As Bill stated, well, well let me start, let me take a step back. Nationally, over 90% of Black and Latino owned businesses are self employed. And as Bill stated, in the Deep South, it's even higher. 96% of Black and Latino owned firms are self employed. Now, these businesses are people that you and I know. These are our nail techs, these are our barbers, these are our real estate agents. They, they provide pet care, and they do other related work. They represent a sector of business that offers ease of entry and flexibility. But if financial institutions are not required to report on business type or credit score, then the data may suggest that self-employed individuals cannot access capital due to their own unpreparedness or credit worthiness and not due to the structural discrimination perpetuated by financial institutions. If the CFPB doesn't collect credit score and business type, effectively, it will overlook the racial dynamics of the reality of the vast majority of small businesses owned by people of color in the Deep South. I'm gonna turn back to Diane so she can talk about why 
these data points should be accessible to not just lenders, but also to the public in, in understanding and assessing the stories and experience of small businesses. That's right, thank you, Kia. This is our third and final policy guidepost on priority um, uh, as, uh, for, for this providing input to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So even if all of the right data is collected from all of the right lenders about all of the right transactions, if everything else we've talked about today is done right, it will not be meaningful if it's not also available and transparent um, in a way that can be reviewed um, by, by the public, by, by community members, by stakeholders and others, including small businesses. Um, so we must make sure that the data is published and robust enough to be meaningful to those, um, to provide the transparency and accountability um, envisioned by this rule. You know, we'll want to be able to look at the data and see it to be able to tell the stories that we've talked about today. Who is applying? Who's who's getting loans? Who's getting high cost loans? And are similarly situated businesses being treated differently by different lenders or even the same lender? You know, this is already what happens with the mortgage lending data and what should be a good model for how this data could be published, where the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau publishes uh, could publish the data um, in a searchable format on their website. Again, just like they do with mortgage lending data that allows for public accountability for the lending patterns of specific lending and financial institutions while also protecting the identity and, of the borrower's data. So the lenders will be identified, but not the individual borrowers. So again, transparency in this data collection activity is a necessary component of this, of this rule and will make sure that small businesses owned by people of color and women are not making sure that they are not redlined, they are not sidelined in this lending marketplace. And this is even more key in the world of the black boxes of algorithms and other lending uh, decision-making elements by, by lenders. So again, importantly, this robust transparency will ensure a more fair, marketplace benefiting small businesses, lenders, and our communities. So these, um, now we've just gone over the three uh, policy guideposts, <laughs> again, of ensuring, uh, ensuring robust coverage of the marketplace, um, including lenders, including uh, the types of loans that are covered, you know, the types of lending activity, the uh, who, uh, who um, is considered a small business, um, so that ensuring the full coverage of the marketplace, ensuring the right data is collected, and then ensuring that that data is available in a public and transparent and meaningful way. So now is how we can all participate. Everyone can have a role. <laughs> this is where the uh, you know, Bill's call to action comes into place. And this is what we call submitting a public comment. So submitting a public comment is the official formal process by which we have the ability to inform and make our opinions heard to a regulatory agency such as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is the way that they will hear us and review what we have to say. They're actually legally obligated to review every single comment that gets submitted to them before January 6th. And so this is just a really key moment to have our voices heard. And I guess, as we said at the beginning, based on where they are in the current rulemaking process, it's clear that they are listening, hearing concerns, and being responsive. And so we know that if we make our voices heard, we have the ability to shape the next steps in what this final rule will look like. Um, so it's really, really important. And also the good news is it's really, really easy. And we're going to be there to help as well. So we will be developing some sample comments um, of outlines of comments similar to the remarks that you all have heard here to today, uh, but with the ability for you to personalize and add your own story and your own experiences about why this matters to you and why this matters to your community. And I also just want to show you what, you know, what the actual comment process uh, looks like. Um, so we'll be able to um, drop this link uh, into the chat. Um, while we're still on here for Q&A, but I'll just open it up and hopefully this will work um, to show you what it looks like when you do it yourself. Um, and again, we uh, will provide our contact information at the end and you know, we wanna be there to support you in, in this process. But uh, so here is the, the portal to submit a comment. Um, in this place is where you would just start, start typing uh, what 
you think is important about what the CFPB got right, what they could do better, why it's important to have this strong rule uh, for small businesses here in the Deep South. If you want, you could do it as a, as a letter on your letterhead um, and upload a, a PDF or upload the document. You don't have to, but it's an option. And then you just provide your contact information here at the bottom and submit your comment. And that's the process. Uh, so hopefully that will look familiar to you as you think about how you want to engage um, over the next uh, few months. Um, so um, I, we will open it up for uh, question and answers uh, over the next few minutes. Um, and while we do that, I'll try to get our slide deck back. And so if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. So Diane and Kiat, at this point, we don't have any questions per se. Um, lots of great introductions back and forth, people telling uh, other folks on the, on the uh, uh, webinar who they are, where they're from, what they're doing. So that's, uh, it's great to share that. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and drop the, uh, the link to the um, public comments into the chat right now so everybody will be able to access that. Um, and while uh, Scott's doing that, I was informed my, the portal was not actually showing before. <laughs> um, so Kiad, is it showing now? Okay. Um, yes, so I'll just run through that again. Maybe you've already clicked on it as well, but here's, again, this is the landing page to submit a comment. Um, this is the place where you can type uh, what you have to say about why this rule matters and what could be done to uh, be better. Um, again, you can upload a file here if you would like, uh, like a, putting a letter on your letterhead um, if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, and then your contact information down here at the bottom and submit comment there. And that's it. That's the process. So um, now I will um, turn it back and we'll just wait a few minutes if there's any questions. Um, and if not, we'll turn it over to Kiat to close us out. So, we do have one question. Uh, the question is, aside from posting analytics online, what other accountability measures will be put in place, fines or anything of that nature? So um, what's the uh, section 1071 really is the, um, the it, it's, it's a rule that it's a data gathering and reporting mechanism that that is uh, the, providing transparency and sunlight into the marketplace. There are other ways in which um, uh, actions can be taken to ensure fair lending practices. So um, there are other, uh, the CFPB, as I mentioned, has a broad set of tools uh, available at its disposal, at its disposal um, in terms of gathering research and taking enforcement actions against uh, different lenders, as well as um, if you have a state attorney general uh, well, you do. You do have a state attorney general <laughs> or other <laughs> enforcement mechanisms um, to uh, to take action, and that's what will be helpful about this data is it will illuminate uh, potential patterns that need further attention, which right now are essentially uh, a guessing game or a black box, um, unless enough um, you know consumer experiences are otherwise um, uh, shared and other mechanisms. So hopefully, it uh, provides a spotlight to where further action is needed. We do have two other questions. Uh, one is, uh, just will a recording of the call be made available? I think so. I think we can we can do that. We we can we can take care of that, and we can we can share with uh, with attendees. Uh, provide a link to that uh, as soon as it's available. Um, we had another question that just said, uh, "Does this only apply to the Deep South? Is it just relevant to the Deep South or to the entire country?" It's the entire country, yeah. Uh, we also have, uh, how do nonprofit organizations uh, fit within the lending accountability uh, component? So in terms of a nonprofit lender, they would be covered by this rule. So there's no difference if you're a lender, you're a nonprofit and you're engaging in you know, more than 25 business, small business loans every two years, you would be required to gather and collect and report this data. And we also had a request for making the, uh, the presentation available as well. Uh, 
Uh, it says, uh, question is, will this allow for lending to black owned businesses uh, with challenged credit? Um, so what it will, it, um, the, the rule is about just gathering the data about who is getting loans and who is getting denied. So the way it should benefit businesses with challenged credit is making sure that banks aren't, banks and other lenders aren't providing, you know, you know, denying black owned businesses with poor credit while also giving that same credit to white owned businesses with that same credit score. So we'll ensure that people are treated fairly regardless of their credit history. But I don't know, Kia, do you wanna add anything more to that? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to quickly say the intent of this rule, I mean, in fact, what you said, is to ensure fair lending in an apples to apples manner. And with the lack, with, without having sp specific data, it's hard to quantify the actual experiences of targeted or rather marginalized groups. But with this data, again, if it's implemented, we will be able to see any disparities that many of you all, many other businesses have actually expressed over, over, the, over the years, uh, whether it be with federal programs or even state programs, or it was just, just with general uh, small business lending with the institution. So the idea is to get language and data to help us understand what exactly is happening from the lender perspective. Diane, did you have something? Okay. Uh, there is another question. It just, <coughs> pardon me. It says, is there a timeline for the initial data reporting? How soon can we expect to see any key results? That's a great question. So, um, and I saw another question in the chat about what our one month deadline. So it's just a little bit about what happens next. What's next in this process, which I'm going to explain this process, but I also want to recall Bill's comments about what we do today, what we do in the next month shapes the path for the next steps. So um, this is a really critical moment and sort of what's coming next. Um, so as you can see here, this public comment period is between now and January 6th. So that's our first step of making sure we get our comments in before January 6th. After that, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, again, is legally obligated to review all of these comments, review them, respond to them, uh, maybe change the proposal in ways that make it better, hopefully, based on our comment or keep the things that already are working really well in their proposal. It's unclear exactly how long that time process could, could last. Um, sometimes it could be up to a year for it to go from uh, you know, the end of the public comment period to issuing the, the final rule. Um, but then once the CFPB issues the, the final you know, rule, the final like rule of the road that lenders will then have to follow, there's a roughly about an 18 month uh, implementation period. Um, and then there'll be another first year of data gathering. <laughs> so, you know, we're somewhere around, you know, still a, a little bit ways out, but uh, that is the nature of regulatory rulemaking. Um, as I, uh, so in the lifespan of regulatory rulemaking, we are actually at the very tail close to the end <laughs> um, in, the, in the rulemaking process. As again, as the actions that we take today will shape the quality and the robustness of the data that we see um, once the rule is, is, is implemented. But I agree on it, like if there's a question about urgency, this is data we all agree should have been gathered you know, yesterday uh, and <laughs> several years ago. So we're glad that it is here at this moment. And Diane, if you're filtering the chat, I, I certainly don't need to read the questions back to you, but if you'd like me to continue, I'm happy to do that. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, we, we have a, a question about, um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing part of my window. Uh, it, basically, it's, uh, is it a requirement that the ask of race and gender is included on the loan application? And just understanding that there, I think the part of the other part of the question was just recognizing there were some disparities. Is, uh, is that a, an element of the, um, uh, of, of the data that is being proposed to that we that be gathered? Yes, it, it is. Uh, 1071 is actually proposing to, is proposing financial institutions to collect and report that data in a disaggregated sense. So it, it won't just say, uh, is the business minority owned or not? It, it will ask for the race of, the, the, of all principal owners. So that would be 
white, black, or rather African, African, African American or black. Uh, I also ask for ethnicity and, and gender as well in a disaggregated fashion. So yeah, that is a part of 271. And that was part of the um, you know congressional mandate that con you know when Congress uh, determined this rulemaking, it said it has to. We have to lenders have to ask and try to collect this data. Um, it will be up to the small business borrowers whether or not they want to provide it. There's no requirement that the small business themselves uh, report it. it um, uh, but we know through the mortgage lending experience that people do tend to there's high high response rate in <laughs> providing that data. And then one important element is. Um, uh, lenders are required to make, you know, there's a, it, not, that data is not used in the actual decision-making uh, process. It's just used for reporting and gathering the information again, just like it currently is in the mortgage lending uh, space. And can you also confirm that individuals can comp provide comments as well? Yes, and highly encouraged, both individuals and organizations. And um, yes, Uh, we have a question. Uh, unlike personal credit, uh, there are multiple other considerations on a small business credit decision beyond credit scores. Uh, has there been any consideration about other metrics uh, that we could consider or suggest as additions to the reporting requirements? Yes, you know, 1071 it also there are several data points that that we covered today, but there are others that that are also being proposed. One that's included is uh, uh, annual gross revenue. It's, it's a part of that that, that also gets at uh, a business's ability to uh, manage debt, not just a credit score. Um, um, so so data points like that are, are being asked uh, to be reported on. Yeah, I think by and large, the Bureau has done a pretty good job of, we want to affirm a lot of the data points that they are already proposing to, to gather, like he had mentioned, um, in addition to strengthening it with a couple of the priority ones, like credit score and, and business type. We don't have any other questions or comments at the moment, so we'll give everyone maybe just a, a quick, uh, quick minute to uh, submit anything else that they might want to ask our panelists. Diane Kiyot, well, um, yeah. by business oh. type, do you mean self-employed versus uh, employer business or industry type? Let me read that again. Um, so when, 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 when we mention business type, we mean um, self-employed, um, sole proprietor, self-employed, um, corporations, C, things like that. Industry type is Technically, it would be a NACE code. So just to be, where does your industry, where does your business fall in what particular industry? But both, we're proposing to, we're proposing 1071 collect business type, but it already captures the NACE code. Uh, again, th that falls into the category of data points that I, we didn't detail today, but additional data points that we are glad 1071 is going to report or, or, or require institutions to collect is going to be Industry type, which is the NACE code, census tract, right, uh, where the business is located. Uh, so those two things are just two additional points um, that 1071 is proposing institutions collect. It may be helpful. Uh, we can include the link to the proposed data points in the chat box, so you all can have that as well to see what all data 1071 is proposing to collect. And we have no further questions at this time. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and close this out. So just let me say thank you all for joining us today. I, I hope this discussion serves as motivation to take action for such an opportunity as this. Uh, as we have mentioned several times during today's webinar, uh, the CFPB is ready to hear from us. They have listened for the needs of small businesses before. 
And with the potential implementation of 1071, they are asking to hear from us again. They have done their part and it's now our time to do our part in continuing to push the policy forward. Now, if we do not submit a public comment or if we do not submit letters that outline what we support about 1071 or what can be improved about the rulemaking, then we would have failed in our responsibility to fight for the most vulnerable. 1071 gives credence to the countless anecdotes of underserved businesses that feel that they have been locked out of capital or they have received expensive finance while their counterparts enjoy a more sympathetic financial service system. The proposed rule has the potential to quantify and make tangible the extent to which financial institutions fail to serve businesses of color and other marginalized groups. 1071 is a critical step in eradicating the racial wealth gap because it's difficult to solve a problem that you do not have the language to describe. It's difficult to solve a problem you don't have the data to compute. 1071 is the missing language. It is the missing data. So again, I ask and implore you all, please submit a comment letter to help ensure the voices and experiences of businesses of color and other marginalized groups are not only quantified, but they're also validated. So again, thank you all for coming. Um, you all can see our contact information on this last slide. Feel free to reach out with any additional questions or any further resources that you may need as you all submit your public comment. Uh, Diane, I'll kick it back over to you if there are any other, any other words you need to express. Kiad, if you have that link uh, to the uh, to the data points, uh, if you uh, uh, or if you can get it quickly, we we'll, we can leave the webinar open uh, uh, just until you get that chat dropped in, and we could also uh, Diane and, and, and Kiad not to uh, not to volunteer us, uh, but we could also include that link in follow up messages where we would also include the video, uh, a link to the video and to the presentation as well. Sure thing. I'm gonna pull it up right now. Okay. I'm going to drop it in the chat. All right. There we go. Well, again, we'll leave the webinar up for just a few more minutes. So anyone who wants to, to click on that link, copy that link can do so. Uh, uh, Diane Kiot, if there's nothing further, we'll just say again, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, and we will uh, we'll provide uh, links and information to the uh, to the resources we've referenced uh, here in the next several days. All right. Well, thank you for attending, and uh, we wish uh, everyone a good rest of your day.